So welcome everybody to this uh, online session organized by uh, EMS Network. Actually, I don't know if I should say good afternoon, good evening, or, or good night. It's noon here in Europe, uh, late afternoon for, for most of you in Asia, and uh, in the night in the States. <clears throat> so let me first recall you that uh, this webinar is a part of uh, EMS 20th anniversary. And to celebrate this anniversary, EMS has launched several events including the, the EMS book presentation series in which takes place today's webinar. The aim is to display and provide a window for the diversified research publication existing in the EMS community, and also to gather prominent and promising researchers in the field. The EMS book presentation series, as you may know, some of you is scheduled on a monthly basis. The first one was proposed in December. And this one is uh, therefore the second one. And uh, <clears throat> all webinars like this one will be available on EMS YouTube channel in order to, to allow people to use them for their own research and their own teaching purposes. So if you don't, like, don't want to be recorded, please turn your mic and camera off. During this session, <clears throat> we propose you to come back on one of the book of the XM series. The, the book dedicated to social enterprise models in Asia. Thanks to the financial support of the share of social and solidarity economy that I am directing at Le Mans University, you probably know that this book is now available in open access. So you will be able to find it on the website of Rutledge, for example, and probably also on the website of EMS. To begin this session, I would like first to greet and to thank Mark Nissen and Jacques de Fourny, who, as you know well, launched and coordinated for several years the XM project. And I would like to, to first to, to, thank, to thank especially Jacques, uh, with whom I co authored the book. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, you, you also know that Jacques is now freshly retired. And for me, it was both both a great uh, honor and uh, a lot of pleasure actually to work with him on this project. So I use this opportunity to say, to say hello to Jacques. And also I would like to use this opportunity to thank again, as I already did Sophie, which, who is here today, because I think that uh, without, without her, this book would have been much more difficult to make and uh, would certainly not have had the same quality that it had. And of course, um, you fully understand that such a book is um, above all collective adventure. And it relies basically on the different contributors that agree to engage in such an adventure. Here they are almost, they were almost 30 per people. And uh, it was also a great pleasure to work with them on this special occasion. The book, Social Enterprise in Asia, uh, includes uh, seven national chapters, six thematic chapters, and three comparative chapters. And uh, compared to other books of the series, <clears throat> um, I think this one is a bit particular, uh, not because of its structure, but because of its coverage. Uh, the 10 surveyed countries here represent, for example, altogether half of the world population and four among the 10 largest economies, according to the GDP criteria. These 10 countries uh, also offer a particularly large diversity, diversity in terms of demography uh, <clears throat> and size, ranging from very small country like Cambodia to very <clears throat> large countries like China or India. The diversity also in terms of culture and language, and the diversity in terms of economic development with the GDP per inhabitant ranging from a few thousands dollars in Cambodia, for example, to several, several <coughs> dozens of dollars in Japan, especially. So looking at the situation of social enterprise and uh, social and solidarity economy in these countries, we also found high disparities. But I think uh, 
Behind the disparities, the survey allows to stress that social enterprise is a dynamic reality everywhere in the surveyed countries, even if the level of recognition, the <coughs> level of support vary a lot between the different countries, <coughs> with especially different levels of development and different political trajectories <coughs> in the surveyed countries. In all of them, however, we can see that social enterprise tends to be a major player alongside or in place of public authorities and the market, and in relation to <coughs> such very important issues like poverty alleviation, work integration, social and environmental transition, care and social service provision, support for people with disabilities, inclusion of disadvantaged pe people or community development, <coughs> etc. During this session, of course, we cannot <coughs> go back over each of these issues and each chapter of the book, but we will try to go into more detail on some of them. And we will try also to update and to extend them since this work was done several years ago already and some contexts have changed significantly since then so our panelists will <clears throat> try to to bring us some new information if they have regarding social enterprises in their own country so let me now briefly present them <clears throat> we will have uh, four panelists today first will be akira kurimoto who is a former professor at Hosei University in Japan and currently a member of the Japan Cooperative Alliance and the International Cooperative <coughs> uh, Alliance Research Committee. Akira wrote a chapter of the book devoted to social enterprises engaged in Japan in the provision of social and health <coughs> services. Then We'll hear to Lisa Dakane, who is the president of the Institute of Social Entrepreneurship in Asia. Lisa contributed to the book <clears throat> by two chapters dealing with social enterprises with the poor as primary stakeholders in the Philippines and in other develop developing countries in Asia. And then <clears throat> we will hear to Harry Pratono who is professor in the Department of Econ Economic Development and that he's currently heading at Surabaya University. So Harry <coughs> contributed in the book to the situation of social enterprises in Indonesia. And then after <coughs> hearing these three contributors of the book, I asked to Zhang Bokyo, <coughs> who is a longtime member of IMES and uh, also an excellent connoisseur of social enterprise in Asia, <coughs> to provide an outside perspective about the book and to make remarks, if he wants, about other panelists' contributions today. Bokyo is currently Associate Professor in the Department of Public Administration at Keen University in the States. So <clears throat> let me recall, recall, recall you that uh, you have time, 10 minutes for your contribution. Uh, in order to save time at the end for interaction with the audience. And uh, <clears throat> every people attending the session will be able to raise questions in the chat if they want, or through the mic <clears throat> if they prefer. <clears throat> so that's all for my short introduction. <clears throat> so I I will give the mic to Akira to open the presentations. So Akira, if you're ready, you can take the screen <clears throat> and the mic for 10 minutes. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for introduction by Eric. Uh, now I am talking about the uh, uh, recognition of social enterprise and social solidarity economy in Japan. Why it is not recognized still? In Japan, uh, the Japanese social enterprise or SSE 
is not visible despite of its enormous size. The agriculture cooperatives were among top 10 uh, world cooperatives in the 2012 World Cooperative Monitor. Number one is Zenno, uh, Economic uh, Supply and Marketing, Marketing Federation of Agriculture Cooperatives. Number two, Zenkyoren, the Insurance Cooperative Federation. Number 10, the uh, Cooperative Bank for Agriculture. And consumer cooperatives accounted for 70% of membership and 30% of turnover of all European counterparts, uh, including uh, British or Swedish or Italian cooperatives. It is based on the Eurocoop statistics in 2012. Insurance cooperatives represent 23% of life insurance market, while corporate banks accounts for 24% of deposits in 2009. And nonprofits accounts for 5.2% of GDP and 10% of employment in 2004. It is based on the Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University's comparative nonprofit uh, organizations. Uh, published in 2007. I'd like to uh, uh, cite one very uh, interesting research made by the ILO and Seoul National University that, is, that was mapping of SSE in Asia in six countries, China, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Malaysia and the Philippines. And this methodology is quite interesting. Uh, they have uh, set up this uh, methodology to distinguish the core social enterprise, uh, core SSE organizations and enterprises that is uh, located in the middle. And uh, uh, the partially uh, Partial Hybrid Organizations, PHO, is located uh, in between three major uh, sectors, social features, economic features, and democ democratic features. So those uh, partial hybrids means that they are partly uh, public sector, partly for profit sector, and uh, this is quite interesting one uh, to uh, map the uh, SSE organizations and enterprises. And uh, here I'd like to uh, draw your attention to two countries, namely uh, South Korea and Japan. South Korea is seen as a number one number one country in which the social enterprise and SSE it has been recognized by the government, academia, and media. While Japan is not uh, recognized at all, so quite uh, controversial, not contrasting picture you can see. And uh, SSE, SSE enterprises, the uh, Korean scholar in Seoul University had uh, uh, listed the, all the cooperatives and the nonprofits organizations. So this is, uh, uh, this uh, author had followed to the very general uh, definition of SSE. That means uh, the cooperatives, mutuals, uh, associations, foundations, and social enterprise. While in case of Japan, that was made by a Japanese scholar uh, located in Seoul. He had chosen, carefully chosen, the really core elements of SSE. So uh, that made made great difference between these two countries, which have very uh, close in the uh, political, economic and social relations. And uh, we, uh, this Korean Japan has shared the very long history 
uh, uh, dominated by China, but uh, very different ways of uh, localized localization uh, these two countries had followed. So uh, here you can see uh, the uh, producer. Uh, this is not seen. Uh, we cannot place it. How to do? It. Okay, uh, no problem. Uh, agricultural cooperatives, fishery, and forestry cooperatives are classified in the core social enterprise, uh, or, uh, core SSE. While in Japan, these producers cooperatives and SME cooperatives had been classified as hybrid between the social and economic dimensions. So quite different uh, results of classification. So uh, SSE is not recognized in Japan, while in Korea, SSE and social enterprise is recognized and very much institutionalized. Uh, we can take a look very briefly on in the history of Korean social economy and the social enterprises beginning in the year 2000. After that, uh, Korea had uh, succeeded to uh, enact the major uh, laws on the social and social uh, social economy, social and solidarity economy, namely the uh, uh, social economy, social enterprise promotion act, community enterprise act, etc. And finally, in two, year two thousand twelve, they have uh, published the new law, the framework act on of cooperatives. That is very a good law, uh, which we are very carefully uh, watching. While in Japan, there is very little different uh, development in these 10, 20 years. As I have said, SSE is still not recognized by the government, media, and academia. In the political economy, uh, I can see the two reasons. One is the political political economy that is dominated by industrial policies. Uh, you, you may know the term nuclear power villages, which had which could not prevent the uh, uh, accident uh, in 2011 uh, in after the earthquake and tsunami. Japan is still. Uh, um, facing the problem of uh, nuclear power plants. And industrial policies were controlled by ministries. And there is a triangle or a coalition formed. We call it the triangle of, triangle of uh, three, uh, triangle of ministries, LDP, Liberal Democratic Party, and trade associations. An economist, Masahiko Aoki, put it bureau pluralism. So there is no center. All the uh, uh, political economy has been divided by the interests of industry. Uh, uh, another uh, element would be the legal as administrative system, very much fragmented legislation in line with industrial policies, M ministries controlling organizational and business laws and administrative system built on such a legal administrative system. For instance, cooperatives, we have more than 10 specific laws. There is no general law, lack of apex body. JCA, uh, Japan Cooperative Alliance is a loose network set up just four years ago. So uh, there is no, identity, sense of identity as a sector, cooperative sector. In case of non-profits, more than 10 specific laws, again, and lack of an apex body, no a network. And there is no uh, sense of identity as a sector. 
and social enterprises, there is no recognition. But there is some positive developments in these 10, 20 years. Some researchers introduced the notion of social economy since 1990. For instance, Professor Kawaguchi, Tomizawa, and Kitajima. Uh, you may know uh, some of them. And the enactment of specified NPO Act in 1998. Three years later, the Kobe, Kobe, uh, Kobe earthquake, which killed 6,000 people just 28 years ago. That, that was just yesterday, 17th January. And a study group on social enterprise was created in 2005. And METI, uh, Ministry of Economy and Trade and Industry, a small uh, and minor enterprise division working group reports on social business in 2008, 2011. Enactment of Workers' Cooperative Act in 2020 after uh, the campaigning of three decades. And study group has been renamed as uh, a study group on SSE just last year. But this development could not generate a momentum for SSE and social enterprise. So that is my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Akira, for your presentation. Very valuable insight about uh, not only social enterprises, but social and solidarity economy in Japan, actually. Uh, <clears throat> we will keep the, the remarks and questions for the end, as I mentioned at the beginning, and okay. move on to, to Lisa uh, in order to, <clears throat> to be able to hear everybody. Lisa, your mic is uh, not opened. Still, Lisa, still your mic appears not to be open and we cannot hear you. Sorry. Okay, that's good. Am I, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, fine. Yeah, thank you very much. Sorry for okay. that. Um, my presentation is about social enterprises in the Philippines, uh, particularly social enterprises with the poorest primary stakeholders, which is actually, um, it's not, my slides are not moving. Oops, sorry. Sorry. Uh, so, so it, my presentation is in three parts. Um, I will discuss social enterprises with the poorest primary stakeholders as a major model of social enterprise, uh, not only in the Philippines, but other developing countries. And then I will talk about the types of services and stakeholder engagement models that social enterprises with the poorest primary stakeholders uh, have uh, in the Philippines. And then the institutionalization process of social enterprises with the poorest primary stakeholders also in the Philippines. Um, given the developing country context of poverty and inequality, we have noted in our research and um, First, I did the research in the Philippines, but later on, we also did research in Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, Thailand, and other developing countries in Asia. And we've noted that this model of social enterprise is also true, where poverty and inequality are stark realities no? as a developing country context. But social enterprises with the poorest primary stakeholders are social mission-driven organizations. They explicitly pursue poverty reduction and alleviation as a primary objective. Uh, they're also wealth creating organizations engaged in the provision of goods and services. But I think a specific feature of social enterprises with the poorest primary stakeholders is that they have a distributive enterprise philosophy. They generate positive economic and social value that is distributed to and benefit the poor as primary stakeholders, as opposed to a private business, which actually has an accumulative enterprise philosophy. That means that a private business usually creates wealth and accumulates the wealth for the, the owners of capital. No? And this is the distinct feature of social enterprises with the poorest primary stakeholders having a distributive enterprise philosophy. 
um, in the study that we've had in the Philippines on the major forms and segments of social enterprises with the poorest primary stakeholders, they include social cooperatives, mostly cooperatives that are composed of and serving the poor and have a community development of societal objectives already incorporated in them. We also have social mission-driven microfinance institutions that uh, take the form of non-government organizations, rural banks, uh, as well as cooperatives providing microfinance services. Uh, we have fair trade organizations that provide marginalized producers access to markets using globally recognized fair trade principles. Uh, we also have what we call trading development organizations engaged in the production or trading and marketing of goods and services, uh, usually in the service of poverty groups. And uh, there's this fifth uh, form or segment that we call new generation social enterprises. These are usually uh, stock for profit corporations or single proprietorships and partnerships established by young entrepreneurial professionals uh, in order to serve the poor. So um, the services provided by social enterprises with the poor as primary stakeholders in our research uh, actually have, there are three main types of services. The first type of service, uh, which um, is, is, we call, is what we call transactional services, which are oriented at assisting the poor to become effective workers, suppliers, and clients. Examples of this, for example, would be the training to meet quantity and quality as well as delivery requirements of the market. No? But uh, there are also two other types of services that uh, social enterprises with the poorest primary stakeholders provide. Uh, one set is called social inclusion services, which are oriented at providing the poor immediate access to basic needs and social services. And examples of this would be setting up community-based systems of water, health, and sanitation, the provision of health services through community hospitals, and the like. The third very important type of service that are provided by social enterprises with the poor as primary stakeholders, which set them apart actually from ordinary businesses in a very big way, is what we call transformational services. They are oriented at enabling the poor to overcome their capability deprivation and to become actors in their own development. So these transformational services uh, include organizing the poor into self-governing cooperatives, leadership development, capacity building on gender issues and the like. So it is this combination of services that actually many social enterprises with the poor as primary stakeholders, whatever the form they take, are providing. Um, in terms of stakeholder engagement strategies, we've found that different ways that social enterprises with the poorest primary stakeholders engage the poor impact on the poor differently. You know? While, uh, of course, the desired model is uh, the, the empower, what we call the empowerment model. It's when the poor are engaged as transformational and transactional partners, where uh, the nature of the roles and capabilities among the poor uh, is that they are developed as empowered workers, suppliers, clients, and owners. Uh, and they are actually uh, organized partners in poverty reduction, as well as community sector or societal change. Uh, the impact of this uh, model or this strategy of empowerment is that they, are, they provide significant outcomes in overcoming capability deprivation and income poverty among the poor. But we've noted that some social enterprises act of the poorest primary stakeholders actually engage in uh, collaboration strategies. No? Uh, these collaboration strategies um, engage the poor as proactive workers, suppliers, and clients, or partners in social enterprise and value chain management. And the impact on the poor is increased incomes or access to services, which lead to social inclusion. So uh, in terms of depth of impact, the empowerment model actually is what uh, is desired. But the collaboration model we've noted is uh, sometimes able to cover a bigger number of the poor. But in many of the cases that we've studied, the collaboration and empowerment model are usually combined no? so that there's actually a reach in terms of um, depth of impact is reached in partnership um, in partnership with the poor in specific areas, but there's also a, col a collaboration model where uh, at the same time that happens in the same social enterprise. Um, we've also noted that among some social enterprises with the poorest primary stakeholders, 
uh, those that we've noted have a control model uh, where they engage the poor as passive workers, suppliers, or clients. Uh, this is not an acceptable model, actually, for social enterprises with the poor as primary stakeholders, as the impact of the poor uh, on the poor is limited to negative, and usually what happens is emission drift. So uh, among the stakeholder engagement models, the desired model for depth of impact is the empowerment model, but the collaboration model also helps to reach a bigger number of the poor. Uh, in terms of the institutionalization process uh, of social enterprises with the poorest primary stakeholders, there's a coalition in the Philippines called Poverty Reduction Through Social Entrepreneurship Coalition that was set up in 2012, and uh, it has four basic, um, basic um, unities. No? Uh, they are, this, uh, the Poverty Reduction Through Social Entrepreneurship Coalition is composed of uh, social enterprises, social enterprise resource institutions, academic institutions, as well as scholars, and um, uh, non-government organizations also promoting social enterprises. And they are united in enacting at the impl and implementing a poverty reduction through social entrepreneurship bill which was actually crafted through a, a, a policy research that was completed in 2012. And then uh, they are engaged in a nationwide education campaign where social enterprises are vehicle, uh, for social enterprises as vehicles for poverty reduction. The present coalition, as we call them, is also involved in setting, developing standards and benchmarks for self-regulation and development of the sector. And uh, of late, uh, the Poverty Reduction Through Social Entrepreneurship Coalition has been developing projects that actually uh, are aimed towards an enabling ecosystem to pursue and demonstrate the Poverty Reduction Through Social Entrepreneurship Coalition, uh, Social Entrepreneurship Program, where uh, to, to show proof of concept. Yeah. So, uh, in terms of critical provisions of the Poverty Reduction Through Social Enterprise Bill, that is being uh, ad, um, advocated in Congress. It uh, seeks to recognize and qualify social enterprises, but social enterprises in the bill are actually uh, anonymous to social enterprises with the poor as primary stakeholders, but some versions of the bill that have been filed are called social enterprises with the marginalized as primary stakeholders. They provide for incentives such as special allocation and preferential treatment in government procurement tax credits, cash incentives, uh, a comprehensive support program, including hybrid financing, where it's a combination of grants and uh, non-collateralized loans through special credit windows with a guarantee fund pool. The grants um, for, this is actually in recognition of the need for social enterprises to provide transformational services, yeah? And then the recognition of women and men as equal partners in development, and then the integration of social enterprise content in the educational system at all levels. Probably one of the more important provisions of the bill is um, enacting social enterprises as partners of the poor in strategic economic subsectors. Strategic economic subsectors as units of planning are intended to achieve scale and sustainability. And there are many strategic economic subsectors where the poor are already, uh, where social enterprises serving the poor are already ma um, playing major roles. No? These are some examples from coffee, muscovado sugar, organic rice and vegetables, cacao, banana, basic and essential oils, educational toys, cocoa choir. And the desired impact of this is that social enterprises will be enabled to overcome subsector constraints in order for us to have a greater impact on poverty or poverty reduction on a grand scale can happen. Because if we talk, for example, of uh, even just a subsector of coconut, you know, uh, there is, there's actually more than 2 million farmers that are involved in coconut production in the Philippines. So uh, the impact on economic, uh, when, when government will support economic subsector development and support social enterprises in this uh, economic subsectors, the impact will be greater. Um, my concluding remarks, I think this is my last slide, um, the, on, on the institutionalization process of social enterprises with the poor as primary stakeholders in the Philippines. Um, we have been lobbying for the present bill uh, since 2012, I say we because actually I am at the at the moment as president of ISEA, I am the convener of the Poverty Reduction for Social Entrepreneurship Coalition. We have had some gains 
And some of these gains include the inclusion in the Bangsamore administrative region of Muslim Mindanao, uh, which is actually a Muslim region that has become autonomous. There are now social enterprise provisions in that uh, Bangsamoro law that was created, creating this autonomous region. Also, the Department of Trade and Industries uh, Micro, Small, and Medium Enterprise Development Council has passed a resolution recognizing social enterprises as partners in poverty reduction and inclusive recovery. This was just in 2020. And uh, in the, we're in the process of dialoguing with the Department of Trade and Industry in order to operationalize this recognition of the department. The Poverty Reduction Through Social Entrepreneurship Coalition has also embarked on a multi multifaceted campaign to engage Congress to pass the present bill now um, because there's a new Congress in place. Uh, since 2012, we have had uh, three Congresses. Um, and then we are putting in place policies and programs. Uh, we're engaging national government agencies and local government units, actually, to uh, engage them to somehow put in place some programs consistent with the poverty reduction through social entrepreneurship bill provisions that could support social enterprises even before the law is passed. And the reason why we're doing this is there's an urgency given the need for inclusive recovery, building back favor, and accelerating the achievement of the sustainable development goals uh, with social enterprises serving the poorest primary stakeholders as very important since uh, the poor have expanded and the depth of inequality has widened. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Lisa, for this contribution on a very original model of uh, social enterprise, including the, the beneficiaries in the co-production on and co-governance. Uh, we are a bit uh, late in our schedule, so I will uh, quickly pass the mic to Harry for the next uh, contribution. And uh, everybody will want to ask some questions to Lisa, keep them for the end. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay, good. Hi, good evening from my place. <laughs> okay, good morning or good afternoon, maybe. Um, okay, uh, thank you, Eric. I like to discuss uh, my chapter, it's a social enterprise in Indonesia. Actually, I like to highlight the government's intervention, yeah, because in Indonesia, uh, the role of government is essential, yeah. And based on the book, uh, I noticed as uh, four type of social enterprise entrepreneurial NPO, social cooperative, community development enterprise, and social social business. And from entrepreneurs NPO, actually, uh, I would like to say that uh, it's, uh, the emerging of NPO is just, just begin in 1999, yeah, 1998, after uh, crisis, Asian crisis, yeah, before uh, the Indonesian government, Indonesian it was was under uh, authoritarian government. So the government banned NBE, NBO only some NBO that uh, have uh, access to the government's allowed to operate. Yeah. But after 1998, so government not control anymore. Yeah. And There's a story about NPO. Then they start from political to economic mission. Let's say in 1998, most of the NPO focus on uh, promoting uh, uh, democracy, and then after that, they convert into economic missions. And turn to social cooperative. Um, actually, as uh, the products or uh, the economic activity based on the professional member, and then most of uh, cooperative uh, focus on financial. Yeah like uh, landings, yeah. And then there's a two uh, key uh, institution, a government institution, Ministry of Cooper Cooperative and uh, Indonesian Cooperative Board. They, they play a pivotal role in determining uh, the cooperative missions or even model. Unfortunately, it's not quite popular anymore in cooperative because the support is not quite strong as before during the during the authoritarians in 1980s or 1970s, 1980s, uh, um, the government put uh, cooperative as the, as the 
what you call the, the the agent of governments to 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 support the government programs. Uh, okay, to the community development enterprise actually is uh, happened in around two thousands because uh, actually it's uh, from grant after the the grantee provide grants and then they ask for the community uh, what is the sustainability and then they try to convert the community development program into enterprise. You know, so one of the best example is uh, Pupo, yeah. Then it's really on community leaders leadership, yeah. And the last is social business. Uh, last time I discussed with uh, Prof. DeForni, so it's really social because uh, because it's business convert to social is um, questionable. Yeah. Uh, for example, one of the biggest company adopt uh, the most popular social enterprise in UK, uh, like Body Shop, and but here in in Indonesia, basically the owner is. Uh, uh, it's a profit company, so it is impossible to 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 confirm that uh, it's still the value of social enterprise still remains. So that's a four model that uh, uh, I discuss on the book chapter. Uh, okay, come on. Okay, uh, that's the most uh, from my point of view. That's the most popular trends. Uh, uh, cooperative, I thought before that's a uh, cooperative is uh, popular in 1980s, but a long time before that things, uh, the national constitutions also state that cooperative is the, the most relevant model for Indonesian economics. And because most of economic is small, they stick together and establish a business model to support together. That's the idea. But in 1998s, the government interventions made the image of cooperative is not quite popular anymore. And when I was in school, uh, uh, cooperative became subjects in our curriculum in from elementary school and their uh, uh, university. But unfortunately, it's not become not popular anymore because. Is associated with the 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 authority and governments. We talk about it. It's old school, yeah. And then recently, the most popular ones uh, about village owned company. It's actually, the government established village uh, village uh, ministry to support village to establish a company. So uh, the most popular one is a tourism industry. And then, okay. Uh, this is I updated my activity. This is with this. Uh, I, I, I work uh, with the British Council FEPNs, and uh, we conducted a survey over 1,388 uh, organizations. And we noticed as a social creative enterprise. So, I mean, among 1,300, uh, uh, 400, around 400, uh, uh creative enterprise and then 300 as social enterprise and and within them uh, there's a, around 200 uh, social creative enterprise this is unique actually and then uh, i like to highlight some challenges first mission drifting yeah uh, when involved stakeholder uh, like investor a government so there's a, like a mission drifting for example uh, the first idea is to promote health and then after that, they move to tourism and then depend on the funding, yeah, or even the market. Number two is legal form. Okay. British um, Council is one of the most active organizations which try to promote uh, social enterprise into legal form. But uh, some of uh, activists said that so if we convert uh, social enterprise activity into the legal form, so, uh, they said that. Uh, they're afraid that uh, it's like a cooperative. Yeah. So it's just like on paper, social enterprise, but actually it's a... Uh, so uh, others argue that it is not effective to convert into so, uh, the social enterprise into legal form because many of them use as a social enterprise, but actually it's, uh, they adopt social enterprise, but actually they have a, a business motive. Okay. Uh, the third issue is political interest. Yeah, um, many co 
just like cooperative when they have a follower and the governments to cover it because uh, with a lot of member it's uh, like uh, when the election date came and then it's become attractive organization so uh, same and other uh, mass organizations do the things yeah uh, they, they some of social enterprise activists converts to become politicians yeah and another issue the last issue is a uh, curriculum reform for social enterprise there's many organizations that try to in uh, conduct uh, training or uh, I call it a uh, enabler social enterprise enabler one could be organization like uh the small social enterprise that become bigger and bigger and then they start to to gather some social enterprise and train young people to to adopt social enterprise model or even university and then we have a social enterprise faculties communities and then of course some uh, international donors yeah that's some issue that i like to share that i share thank you very much Thank you very much, Harry, for, for coming back to the, to the main results of your chapter and also updating with your more recent uh, research projects about social enterprises in uh, Indonesia. So through the three contributions we, we've heard, uh, we can have an insight about the book. Uh, and now I will ask to, to Bokyo to, to provide a, uh, an external uh, view about the book and uh, maybe to, to comment if he wants about uh, what uh, was presented by the three <coughs> contributors today. So Bokyo, it's, it's yours now. All right, thank you, Eric. And thank you, uh, EMS uh, Research Network for this opportunity with phenomenal speakers. And that actually well reflects um, that the, the feature of the book by represented by the three speakers today. I really enjoyed London Law from three speakers that includes uh, three speakers, uh, Akira Akrimoto from Japan case, and Harry Pramoto in Indonesia, and Elisa Dakane and Philippines. And I see the, the selection of those panels actually really well reflects the structure of the book. For example, the health and social service provision uh, by the Japan case in overall in general model and rural community development by our um, the Philippine colleagues, Harry Pramoto, uh, uh, Pratono, and also social inclusion uh, actually represented by um, Mary, Lisa, and the Kanye. So I see that that actually shows the whole structure of the book. So I'll just briefly go over each speaker, but then I'll just move into uh, overall um, kind of my comments linking to the book, uh, the, this uh, social enterprise in Asia book. The first, Akira uh, Kurimoto actually well represented actually the, the, the nature feature of uh, the Japan model of social enterprise actually link, linking to the mapping uh, developed by IRO and SNU that actually really shows that the, the future and the legal alternative system and the fragment system actually shows that and how and where, what's the unique in the Japan model. And actually that the term, actually the idea about the Bureau uh, pluralism very unique and very interesting to me and to, to understand the Japan and also social economy in Japan. So, and then uh, I really learned a lot from Japan case, and especially because in, in South Korea and Japan case usually compared a lot in actually in combination in, in parallel. So I'm really interested in, in your presentation. Thank you. And then moving to uh, the Lisa Dakane's presentation really shows that distributive enterprise and social enterprise philosophy that was really uh, insightful to capture from the field in um, the, the, from, uh, from the case. And this shows that the variety of services and I actually, the model you provided actually is really uh, comprehensive to showing the control model and collaboration model and empowerment model, especially see that the poor or the people poor as a stakeholder is a very key point because understanding a organization, specifically social enterprise is actually very important for that actually understanding stakeholders is the key but based on different models of a transaction model, social inclusion model, and transformation model, it's based on different understanding of the poor uh, as different uh, types of um, um, people or maybe group uh, in understanding the relationship. So that actually lead to stakeholder engagement strategies, very, uh, very insightful and actually gives a lot of lessons 
um, to see. And actually, very thank you very much for introducing and that actually present peel, a bill by present coalition and your activities. It's really um, kind of uh, show what this practitioner and scholars can do, actually bring the change through the social enterprise. But thank you very much. And uh, the third one, the Harry uh, Pertono, and that really shows about their, their, especially the function in actual rural development and social enterprise. And it's well uh, overviewed type of a social enterprise and history and also trends. The trends part is, was very interesting to show uh, how you named labeled and the existing uh, types of uh, social ent enterprise and co-ops and also company and uh, in, in a different name and trends over time. So that was really uh, interesting to see how people in different countries, different society um, define it differently. That lead to actually our, this, the, the EMES book and projects in nature, I will do at the end of a quick uh, summary. So Harry Parton was at Wells um, wrapped up with actually challenges. And uh, I really noticed that the legal form agenda and also political interest and mission drifting. That's really uh, important, shared by all country, not just in, um, in your country's case. So uh, going back, actually summarizing all, I would like to see maybe three points uh, out of this all the individual presentations. The first one, I really see out of the three presentations, the organic nature and approach actually encouraged by the CMES Eastern project. So each three uh, presentations presented with different terms and different history and also different understanding and legal structure. But in the end, that actually beautifully uh, captured uh, this own society. So I would like to emphasize that how this book, actually the Eastern Project based book, actually really respected, appreciated that the, uh, the, the nature of the organic uh, approach by its scholar because they didn't uh, propose any unified prior a pre predetermined definition. So that's why I see from all those uh, presentations. Second, I see all three uh, presentations well capture different functions and nature and the, which actually well selected by Eric to show the rural community development and the social service provision and also uh, poverty alleviation actually well represented by presentations today. So that's actually what I see the different functions of, uh, um, of the key functions of uh, social enterprises. The last I wanna see um, is actually the cross um, discipline and a cross continental conversation so if I see each uh, country case and also leading the books, uh, EMES, the, the a social enterprise in Asia and shows uh, actually different conversation of different continents. So today it's all Asian uh, continents and Asian um, practitioners and scholars, but actually if you locate them in a big picture, what the Eastern projects have done, actually very fascinating because uh, I wasn't, I noticed that actually the couple of uh, a uh, common themes actually occurred through the three presentation was actually institutionalization. Issue. How much is institutionalized? How much legal form actually support and political political institution? And that actually really um, very stood actually um, visible in three presentation. So maybe at the end I'll ask question whether is it desirable to government actually recognize the support and formalize it, maybe to some extent control it. So maybe that's one question I will ask to everyone, uh, maybe if you have in time. So maybe the, that leads to my final point about whether Asia model exists. What, what do we have to discuss Asia model? Because given that we all presenters that really based on different understanding in the context, do we really have to discuss Asia model? What we, does, we don't need to do it, or we don't have to do it, okay? So that's one I wanna see that. And the second part is that, and, the different the legal framework and also the meso level factor, including the partnership resource mix, and also probably religion base based. So I just want to wondering compared to other countries, what's unique in each country? So I just maybe maybe you can highlight again its presenters, but actually what I noticed that from each presenters, it was fascinating to see how they presented its country case. So I'll wrap up here because time time is up. But thank you very mm -hmm. much. Thank you very much, Bokyo, for, for your immediate feedbacks about uh, the presentations and also for, for uh, stressing so explicitly the, the qualities you found in the, of the, in the book and uh, uh, in the XM project more generally. Uh, so we, we have a few minutes left. Uh, <clears throat> so if anybody wants to ask 
raise a question to to, <coughs> to somebody in particular, you can raise your hand maybe uh, and take the mic. Uh, I saw Linda raising her hand uh, during uh, the talk, the presentation. So I don't know if she still wants to <coughs> to say something well well i'm here thank you very much i was just you know applauding <laughs> i <Okay>. was applauding <laughs> the, the the presentation but let me just say thank you very much you know it's very insightful um and uh, really 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 uh raises the questions uh, of history of you know national cultural you know uh societal um the framings for uh, social enterprises and social entrepreneurship and, and solidarity and social economy. Uh, and, and thank you for that. Um, so I'll just pass the word uh, if anybody else have comments. Thank you very much, Linda, for, for your warm words. It's very encouraging. Uh, does anybody else want to, to give a feedback or, or raise a specific question? Maybe I had uh, myself a question to to Lisa. Um, mm -hmm. Lisa, you <coughs> you stress in your presentation a specific model uh, of uh, the poor with the poor as uh, primary stakeholders. Uh, looking at uh, the typology that uh, Jacques and Mark and Matt uh, realized uh, based on the XM project, uh, this dimension um, does not appear very explicitly in their in their models. So uh, do you think uh, it's because uh, your original, the original model that uh, you, you, you stress is specific to, to, some, to Asia, for example, or to, to some countries, or, or, or is there another reason that you can imagine? By typology, did you mean the social cooperatives, the entrepreneurial nonprofits, as well as the uh, social business models? Is that what mm -hmm. you were referring to, Eric? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, yeah, they, actually, they form of for models. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, the 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 segments that I talked about were segments that came from the uh, empirical studies that we've done. However, uh, in succeeding discussions on social enterprise with the poorest primary stakeholders, actually, the three main models that the uh, social enterprise in Asia came up with, uh, we saw as very relevant. They are the three main models, actually. If you synthesize the segments that I talked about, they will come right down to being social cooperatives, entrepreneurial nonprofits, as well as um, social businesses. So mm -hmm. I saw the those typologies as more uh, synthesized, I think, than the segments that I talked about. Mm -hmm. So, so they are dis disseminated uh, in inside the role of the model yeah so actually when you talk of, when social enterprise with the poorest primary stakeholders have all these types across and then a combination also because some there are some social enterprise with the poorest primary stakeholders that have actually that have a foundation and then a social and then social cooperatives together and then they together they set up a social business you know so mm -hmm. uh we 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 can see them uh as uh you know, different uh, types or different typologies, but we also see them sometimes as a combination. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay, thank you, Lisa, for explanation. I actually found the typologies very uh, useful. The typologies that were synthesized very useful because they are actually the main types, I think, of social enterprises, even with the model of social enterprises with the poorest primary stakeholders, they would be the main types. Mm -hmm. It's so uh, two past one. Uh, um, Eric, sorry to interrupt. There's a question yeah. Um, yeah, okay. on, on the chat. Sorry, I didn't see. So. Let me, go, let me go to the question. So maybe the persons, the person who who raised the question in the chat can can take the mic. It's maybe it will be better. Yeah, I think it's Fajar. I don't know if he can take on, you know, if he can turn his his microphone on and take the the floor. Otherwise, we can read it. 
excuse me. Yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon uh, from Nepal. I like to ask uh, one question here. Uh, uh, I like to congratulate to everybody that you are doing really great presentation. Thank you so much for this. And uh, I have also done last time my presentation, but it okay. Anyway, I'm also a social entrepreneur in Nepal. And what I'm thinking, like um, I found there are so many great, um, you know, research and work going on. And uh, can we categorize the people from uh, different countries who are working on these, uh, what areas? So can be the group of the people can work, uh, share their experiences and work and can do some uh, kind of group work. Can we do like that? Can we make the group like that and to work together? Did you hear, understand me? What, what do you mean exactly? To, 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 to yeah, make like, some groups uh, you know, like between, people, between they countries? Are doing different things in different countries, right? Yeah. And maybe some people, they are doing the same thing in different countries, you know? Mm -hmm. So if we can come together, uh, the people, they are doing same kind of work, you know, can be a, a group and to share each other and to work together. Is there any possibilities to make like this kind of platform over here? Yeah, for um, sure. Maybe, for maybe sure. I can just start by answering the question, Eric, for us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Institute for Social Entrepreneurship in Asia actually set up five platforms. Uh, and part of the, those platforms are intended as learning platforms, among others, but they are actually along thematic areas, but they're um, learning platforms on social entrepreneurship. And mm -hmm. there are five, uh, as I said, five thematic areas, no? but maybe it's too much to explain all those five thematic areas now. But if you're interested to uh, work with uh, social enterprises in other countries on a thematic basis, uh, there is actually room for us to work with you. So please get in touch with us. The Institute Thank for so Social good. Entrepreneurship in Asia. Thank, Thank you, Maria. Thank for, for, for your answer. Uh, I'm coming back to Faja's question in the chat. Uh, it was about the faith-based uh, organizations, mm -hmm. especially in Indonesia. Is mm -hmm. there a strong influence of uh, faith-based uh, social enterprises in in the Indonesian context area. Do you have any question about that? Yeah, for sure. There's uh, thank you for the questions. The largest community is Indonesia is Muslim, and then there's a two big organization, namely Nahdlatul Ulama and Muhammadiyah. And Muhammadiyah is uh, like single organization, very big, very organized. Well. The Nadatul Ulama is a, it's like a cooperative model. Yeah, it consists of a lot of uh, uh, um, what you call it's a, like uh, consists of a lot of organization. So, and Muhammadiyah has uh, managed uh, a lot of uh, hospitals, uh, schools. There's the most popular one. School hospital is the most popular social enterprise, and then. Um, in Indonesia, the, in the governments, uh, there's a two important minister, minister of religion or minister and minister of education. And typically, uh, if the Muhammadiyah is the one get a position as the minister, member for Muhammadiyah, person as a minister of education, then the minister of religion could be one from Natatul Ulama. So that's a uh, pivotal rule, especially during the election. This is we not political party, but most of the leader of this country, of the organizations, very powerful, yeah. Maybe just like Catholic in the Philippines, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, uh, but Pamadia and Nahdlatul Ulama is look like a very different, yeah. Uh, Nahdlatul Ulama is like old school. They, they, they really adopt in local culture while Muhammad, uh, sorry, this is uh, Nathadu Lama, while Muhammadiyah want to try to purify this, uh, the Muslim, yeah, Muslim value. So that's a difference between Muhammadiyah, but uh, Muhammad is more competitive, yeah. That's a uh, uh, really net. Uh, last time I have presentation in, in, but social enterprise in Singapore, one of issue is uh, cultural conflict. Yeah, 
uh, uh, because now in most of Indonesia like just <clears throat> like follow, to follow Malaysian culture they, they like to wear scarf yeah and then it's become popular and then so some school try to encourage their student to wear the things and then mm, can this become issue eh? again uh, next year will be uh, election uh, for the uh, for the president uh, what what organization also really play before the rule and of course uh, they there's some candidate from one of the organizations each other. So in yeah. terms of economic, yes, political. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harry. And uh, on that uh, issue specifically, I would like to recall that uh, you will find one chapter in the book uh, dealing especially with uh, religious influence uh, <coughs> on social enterprises in, uh, in Malaysia, Cambodia, and uh, South Korea. Um, Eric, one... is there time for me to say something about faith-based uh, organizations in Indonesia? Because we have a member in Indonesia, Dompet mm -hmm. Doafa Republika, which is actually promoting social entrepreneurship. Uh, uh, and they're not working only with Islamic uh, groups, but also as a whole. I think the most important influence is that they're able to use Sakat as a source of funding, you know, the, the faith-based uh, contributions of Muslims, they're able to put them together in funds to support social enterprise development. And that's a progressive development, I think, in Indonesia that we are trying to study even in countries like the Philippines where Muslims are there. Uh, there, haven't be, there hasn't been that phenomenon no, of the use of these funds um, collected by religious uh, organizations uh, for social enterprise development. But in Indonesia, uh, there's actually a very vibrant uh, um, movement among those uh, collecting zakat uh, or tithes, Muslim tithes, uh, and financing social enterprise development. And that's very exciting. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. I think in, uh, in uh, every context, actually, you will find uh, this link between uh, religious uh, groups or religions and social enterprises. Uh, for example, in Korea, there are many links between Buddhist religion, uh, Protestant religion, and uh, you also can find some very historical roots uh, <clears throat> for cooperatives in some specific Catholic leaders, for example. Uh, maybe the time is going on. Uh, maybe one last question that was uh, raised in the chat, and then we will finish on that. Um, it's to question for Akira uh, about the competition between health insurance and social enterprises in Japan. Is there specific competitions, or maybe also some some uh, collaboration, <coughs> especially with a long term care uh, insurance system, for example? But Akira, maybe you you will you certainly will be able to answer better than me. But your your mic is not open. Thank you for your question. Yes. Uh, now uh, the social care, especially elderly care and health care, are now done by the public, for profit and non profit and cooperative organizations. So that is uh, in really. Uh, uh, quasi market, where uh, the consumers have the uh, right of to choice to choose the uh, providers, while the uh, finance is done through taxation, the social insurance, and uh, co-payment by the people. So, uh, in the open access system, especially for the healthcare and the elderly care. These uh, institutions, public, for profit, non profit, and cooperatives are competing each other. And there is very little uh, collaboration between them because, on the market, they are competing to get the, uh, uh, so to say, uh, support and, uh, so to say, uh, Uh, to get uh, support and uh, uh, to uh, have some uh, transactions uh, with those entities. So uh, amongst the uh, 
social economy institutions or social enterprises, the competition is a main tone. But of course, there are some uh, chance opportunities for collaboration, especially between the cooperatives and nonprofits to serve the uh, patients or elderly people uh, so that they can have some, uh, they can join forces to solve many social problems. So there are such kind of the collaboration. So we are now investigating in such a good case of collaboration. But basically, uh, those institutions, providers are uh, in the competition each other. That's a reality.